Hello, and welcome back to the show. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. And we are back from QuickBooks Connect in Las Vegas. David, Exhausted impressions. back. Exhausted back. Exhausted back. I feel great, actually. I had such a fun time uh, connecting with dozens, hundreds of people, listeners of the show. Um, I got to present a session. We got to see Ryan Reynolds, who is not just an actor, but a very successful entrepreneur and marketer. Uh, David, your impressions of the show? Um, I, it needs to be longer because you can't meet everybody you want to meet. I mean, there's, you know, thousands of people at this conference because everybody knows everybody. It's a very community driven event, but there's just not enough time. And I can't go to Vegas four days, five days, <laughs> six days. It's impossible. Yes. Um, three days, three days was long enough for me or three nights. Um, but, but in general, it is always a great event. I think the, uh, breakout sessions are always good. The, the, the keynotes this year were a little bit more product focused. That's, that's been a trend at Cooper's connect a little bit more, more information stuff about the keynotes. Um, I thought Ryan Reynolds was great. I, the one quote I liked about him is the whole, like, just hurry up and do it. Like why have meetings about stuff for nine months? Just you're making a 15 second commercial, just record yeah. it and throw it up there and see what happens. And I, I and then I also loved how I didn't know this about Deadpool and some, like he didn't have the budget. Yeah. And so he just utilizes what's available. So if they had wanted a special effect, they couldn't afford it. He just like turned that into part of the movie script. Yep. And that's a really smart thing to do is you can you can do a lot. D don't be constrained by your lack of money or lack of budget. Just be more creative. Yeah. You don't have to spend a lot of money. And honesty resonates. People like authenticity these days. And I'm sure every one of our listeners has seen those Mint Mobile commercials from a few years ago. I don't know if they still do them, but you know, it's just Ryan Reynolds in front of a green screen talking about how they couldn't afford to do anything more. And that's because they take all the money uh, that they were going to spend on advertising, and then they reduce the cost of Mint Mobile as a discount uh, service. And he talked a lot about how um, he used his celebrity to promote these discount products in a way that was unusual. A lot of times, celebrities go way up market, aspirational perfume, products. For, uh, yeah, perfume. Johnny Depp and perfume and all that. And he said, I wanted to do something different. And so he used his celebrity and he bought into these companies. That's the other thing people don't know is that Ryan Reynolds, yeah, he might make $20 million on a movie, right? But he took that $20 million that he made from Deadpool. I don't know if that was it, but I think it's around that. And he rolled that into Aviation Gin. And then he marketed the heck out of Aviation Gin and made a ton of money. And same thing with Mint Mobile. He bought 25% of Mint Mobile, marketed the heck out of it, fixed everything with that, and sold it to... I think was it T-Mobile for like a billion dollars? Yeah. So this guy is is 10xing all of his movie fees by investing in businesses and growing them and selling them. And now he does marketing. Anyway, it's it's it was a great keynoter to have for a co a conference like Connect which is attracting 2500 entrepreneurial accountants to come together because we need that kind of advice. We need to we need to know you can you can do this on a shoestring budget because we don't have massive resources, most of us who are in the world of client accounting services when we go off and start our own firms, right? Well, we don't we're have doing... staff. We don't have anybody to do the work. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's, we're just really, we're, accountants might be super resource constrained, never mind exactly. just budget constrained. Yeah. yeah, so really good pick on the part of the attendees, or not the attendees, the uh, the organizers. And I think the attendees really loved it. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And then the opening talk with, um, I just blinked out her name now that we're about to talk about her. <laughs> Um, Jade Simmons, right? Jade Simmons, yeah. It's the, the classical pianist slash 50 other roles she plays, including entrepreneur, etc. But she gave an opening talk, and I forgot who sent it to me on Twitter, but her opening talk was so amazing and inspiring and had so much energy that they said if we showed that to every accounting 101 class, we'd have an abundance of accountants in the profession. <laughs> Well, let's get to the features and stuff, features. David. What's new with QuickBooks announced at QuickBooks Connect? What got the biggest applause was a lot of people who've used QuickBooks online, they have a menu for you, the accountant, and then your clients get a different menu. So then you're trying to talk to your account, your client and say, click here, and they're like, they don't have the same menu. It's going to be one unified menu. That got the most applause. You know, like, It's such a simple thing and it's such a no-brainer, no but... It, 
people loved it because it solves such a huge pain. And I liked it because it indicates that the team at Intuit, the product team, the accountant team, the developer team are really listening to accountants. And that is one thing I've noticed in the last few years in particular is Intuit is really listening to accountants and building features that accountants want. Yeah. So a great example of that, QuickBooks Ledger, which is the less expensive streamlined version of QuickBooks online designed for write-up work. This is equivalent to Zero Cashbook, which is one of the reasons that I built a practice on Zero was because I could affordably do it and move my clients off of QuickBooks Desktop thanks to this Ledger prod product, which was uh, for for Zero was I think you know ten bucks around ten dollars a month, depending. It changed around. It, it switched around depending on the year and the discount you got. But it was very affordable to do that because for basically, I don't know, hundred dollars or so a year, I could host those files online and connect them to bank accounts and pull in the transactions and code them and do that write up work. Yeah. And that was a lot of our clients, right? They didn't need all the bells and whistles. And this is something that has kept a lot of firms from moving off a of desktop. It just wasn't affordable to do it in a QuickBooks Online subscription that costs fifty to seventy dollars a month. And and I, at first, when they announced that they're offering batch migrations, I remember sitting even next to you, and I was like, "Who the hell is going to migrate, <laughs> you know, seven hundred files at once, right?" But yeah. I, if they're all write-up clients, and the QuickBooks Online files are simple, and you just want to dump everybody over, that batch upgrade or batch migration to QuickBooks Online is really, and, and maybe that's what they're anticipating. Is, yep. is massively massive migrations up to that. Well, and they gave an example of a firm that moved 700 accounts in a single day from QuickBooks Desktop. So that's that's a lot. Yeah. Um, it's ten dollars a month. It includes automated bank feeds, bank reconciliation, financial statements, 1099 tracking, and seamless transition to tax preparation. I believe that means that you can import into their tax products directly from uh, QuickBooks Online. The best thing about it, unlike QuickBooks Self-Employed, which actually isn't QuickBooks, by the way, it's really Mint, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that has a skin and they called it QuickBooks, is there's a path. So you could be doing write-up work for somebody on the QuickBooks Ledger product, and then eventually they're like, oh, I want you to do monthly cash for me. And I'll, because we're busy enough, I'm doing invoicing now out of QuickBooks or whatever, you can upgrade them to a normal QuickBooks. So you mentioned some QuickBooks online um QuickBooks Online accountant improvements with the menu. There are also now expanded roles and permissions, granular, customizable roles for your team. So you can limit access in a very detailed way to banking, sales, or expense data. You can delegate, you can delegate highly sensitive tasks to more experienced employees, such as paying invoices or running payroll, which is a very welcome change. Well, between that being added and then speaking of payroll, so they added uh, HR tools to payroll, which were, which were neat. And because I think a lot of people have been using the uh, notes field to track all this kind of stuff about employees, right? Personal information, like, like it really needs to be in its own field because it needs to be protected by permissions. But they also added to the QuickBooks payroll the cost allocation feature. So yes. basically it's a table and you could break down a paycheck by jobs, expense accounts, classes, and it's and you just keep breaking it more granular and granular. And if I take the combination of the granular permissions and you take the cost allocation stuff of the payroll, those might be the last two hurdles from desktop. Desktop enterprise desktop to online. Maybe mm. inventory is still not all the way there, but those are two major hurdles because now construction companies can really utilize QuickBooks online in the same way they use QuickBooks desktop. Yes. Yeah, and that was the example they had and that's one of the things you haven't been able to do in online is you'd have to use journal entries to do it, not a not a pretty thing. And now you can now you can allocate those costs. Uh, we had Chart of Accounts templates announced. That one, I think, got the biggest round of applause from the audience. So you can upload templates and you can save them in your QuickBooks Online Accountant dashboard, and they are available whenever you set up a new client. And you can have multiple of them, and you can upload from Excel. So if you are niched and you have a particular chart of accounts that you use for all your real estate clients, Upload it there. Your team has access to it. Boom. Pop it into a new account. 
yeah. saves a ton of time because you used to have to do this all manually, I understand, you know, one at a time, deleting accounts, changing accounts, that sort of thing. So another welcome change. Like, like these are things that people have been asking for. It's so great to they're see They're boring. That. They're not sexy. It's just, you're right. Yeah. You're right. They're just, you know. But it makes a meaningful difference for a firm because think about all the time that's saved. If you're a growing firm and you're adding, you know, you could add one client a month or dozens of clients a month. And uh, that's a big difference, even with just one a month. Um, any others? Oh, there were some changes to the QuickBooks Pro Advisor program. I'm not sure. Did you follow that? Anything not big not there? too much. I mean, yeah. they're gonna um, they're offering new training and third-party apps that connect to Pro Connect Tax. Um, I know the uh, Intuit Developer Team is gonna have a new um, like badge for apps that it's like accountant approved or recommended i think that's a little bit tied in there um but the 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 community thing for the certification like it's got a revamp on the ui but they don't really show it so i didn't really see it it's like in the press releases they talked about it but you don't really see it per se Mm -hmm. on there um one other thing that was not on main stage and arguably it should have so the intuit developer team gave a talk about the ecosystem and apps and the changes they're making to apps and they have a function they're adding that arguably would have been a standing ovation at the um, at the main stage, I'm going to sc- uh, share a screen of this quickly. Hey, that's here. me. <laughs> that's you. We'll talk about your presentation soon. But so what they did? It's, it's sorry, it's a blurry photo. You know, I was uh, kind of on one hand trying to focus with my thumb, but if you notice, that's the QuickBooks app card, right? So the App Store has app cards, and and usually there's three buttons on those those app cards. There's a Learn More button. There's a Get App or Add App type button and then now they've added a new button says that's called test app and so me being somebody who's always testing apps and many times accountants usually are trying to test apps to see if they're good fits for clients you connect an app it puts some data in quickbooks so you create a bunch of fake things like test customer a vendor customer a test test item right you're syncing data sometimes you mess up and you sync too much real data and now you've duplicated data you have a mess right yeah what it's going to do you hit that button that says test app it copies your client file into its own separate sandbox connects the app to the sandbox and for up to 45 days you can play play around in it and this then when you're is done, genius. When you're done, you're done. Amazing. What a great feature because I've done this. I've had this happen where I've connected an app to test it to a client account and it has messed things up. And then I have spent hours undoing the mess. And sometimes you can't delete the mess. You can only avoid it and it's in the record forever. And, and I'm kind of a perfectionist and I feel like uh, I hate that mess. Oh my yeah, it, it gets messy. And then mine was so bad two years ago. I was testing so many different things in my real QuickBooks file that it actually delayed me getting my bookkeeping done. Yeah. Because I had so I was always like I different. I gotta delete that mess or fix that mess or and I just constantly delayed it. And th- what's great about this, the accountants before the session was even over were figuring out like, oh, I could use this not even to test an app. I wanna train the client. I want I have a new employee and I don't want them messing up the real data. Yes. It's they're they're seeing all these other uses for it, and it's it's yeah. really arguably that should have been shown at the main stage that feature, not in some developer breakout, because ultimately, like only a portion, a teeny portion of people know that feature is coming, and it's arguably one of the most important features they're adding. The training concept is great. So create a company file; it could have test data in it, and clone that into the staging environment or the sandbox. That's what it's called clone it into the sandbox, and then give that to somebody that you're thinking about hiring and ask them to do a monthly reconciliation cycle or, you know, go through, like, that's the best way to test a new hire is to just give them the job to do and see how they do. And it even even if the bank feeds are connected, it'll pull down the latest transactions, but then when you open up the real file, it'll go pull down the latest transactions. So you're not, it's, it's really an amazing feature, like I said. Nobody, well, our listeners will know about it, so hopefully now it'll get some attention. But I think it was one of the, the best uh, features that they probably added. Uh, the other one that was great, Blake, is the sessions. We mentioned the sessions. You had a session. I and did. There's a little photo of you in the session here. <laughs> CPA uh, practice advisor put me on their homepage for homepage. a day. I was honored. I know, it's by it's that. amazing. Like you're, it's it's your session. It's there was standing room only in your session. That one empty chair there was my chair. I got up to take a picture of you. Um, and you did a talk on AI, and it was super well received. I think my understanding it was one of the 
most uh, filled up sessions of all the breakouts. Yep. Um, but you you basically really started walking people on how AI is going to save accounting. And one example you gave, which I, I thought was so amazing and illustrated the power of, of AI, is you were talking about, you know, you had a friend and he texted you with, and he used the same f- like language all clients use, like, hey, I have a tax question. It'll only be five minutes. Can you give me a call? Yeah. The, the I'll let you text, take it from there. The, the actual text, which I shared in my presentation was, I have an accounting question to ask. Let me know when you have five minutes for a call. And the joke is, of course, there's never a five-minute call. It's never a five-minute question. And I was in a pickle because this is a close friend of mine, and I have redacted names here to protect the innocent. Um, and I got this while I was relaxing at the pool. I had just done my afternoon swim, and I didn't really want to call him back. But I did. I got a, a voicemail for him, so I... I I figured, okay, he'll call me back when, when he's free. And he did, but I wasn't available. And he left me a voicemail. And I noticed when I went to go listen to it that Siri had transcribed the voicemail. It was kind of a messy transcript. Oop, and she just uh, talked to me. <laughs> oh, no, 23 voicemails. I'm going to... She's not supposed to talk to me when I have Do Not Disturb on, I guess, but um, I'm not going to use that name now. So so she who shall not be named um, transcribed the voicemail, and I thought, I wonder if ChatGPT can help with this. So I copied the voicemail transcript, copied it all, and I pasted it into ChatGPT on my mobile. And by the way, I'm doing this all sitting by the pool. And I said, I am an accountant. I got this question from a friend. This is an auto-generated transcript, so it may have spelling or grammar errors. Please interpret it and tell me how I can answer his question. And then I pasted in the voicemail transcript. And to summarize the question, it's basically, uh, my friend is buying a house. He's borrowing some money to do it. And the person lending him the money, a personal friend, is concerned about gift tax and asked him, do we need to do anything to avoid this becoming like a a gift tax situation with the IRS? And my friend's instinct was, ah, the IRS is over over understaffed. It's not going to ever be an issue. Do I really need to do anything about this? And he was calling me to ask. And so I put this to ChatGPT and it gave me a really thoughtful Response, it said the critical factor is whether the transaction is structured as a genuine loan and not a gift. For the IRS to recognize it as a loan, there should be a formal agreement in place, often a promissory note, blah, blah, blah. Without formal documentation, the IRS may indeed view the money as a gift, especially if your friend doesn't repay the loan in a timely manner or pay interest. So the recommendation from ChatGPT is to have a promissory note. Uh, Pay interest, right? have a record of it. And even if the IRS is currently facing resource challenges, it's important to comply with the law and maintain proper documentation. This is everything that I would have told him. And so it was a little formal. And I said, now draft it as a text message so I can send this back to my friend. And I told ChatGPT, this is a close friend. Keep it, you know, casual. It drafted me a text message. Understood regarding the loan situation, it's crucial that the arrangement with redacted, is properly documented as a loan. A formal promissory note with repayment terms, including interest, should be in place. This is what differentiates a loan from a gift in the IRS's eyes. Ensure all loan features are clear and the agreement is signed by both parties. Remember to include any interest income on your tax returns. Despite IRS resource issues, proper documentation is key. If redacted has doubts, a consultation with a tax advisor could be very reassuring. Best, Blake. I copied that and I pasted it, and that took me five minutes. So it's an actual five-minute accounting question, really a tax question, uh, and that has never happened in the history of the world, I don't think, and that's thanks to AI. And I shared this because it's a real example of how you can use ChatGPT today to speed up one of the most painful parts and the most time-consuming parts of being an advisor, which is answering all these questions. And and, and every accountant... Is totally capable of writing this email. 
you're fully capable of it. But it'll oh, yeah. probably take you 25 minutes to an hour because you'll get distracted. You'll type some of it. You'll distract it. You, do, 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 do. you get a cup of coffee. It just it doesn't. Yeah. It just eats up your day or stacks up. You have two, three, four, five of these, and you can't get to them. Then the client emails you a second time. But yeah, the this is where anybody can do this, and it's not about replacing your experience that you're giving to the customer. It's not about replacing the work you're doing. It's really just making you, you're just utilizing, it's like having a personal assistant, right? Yeah. Or if it, you have an intern, hey, answer this question. I'm going to review it right before you hit send. Okay, send it off. Yeah, it's what I would have written, but honestly better. So I just got to review it and then send it. And I would love thinking about AI in the future, how it's going to automate all of these accounting workflows once we build the software. But I realized that we need to start using it now to understand how that's going to work. And I, I've polled audiences, and I think I talked about this on the last episode, that my guess is only about 20% of accountants or CPAs have used any of these tools, have tried them like meaningfully, not just to write a poem or write song lyrics, right, to actually use it. And I think if you start using it in this way while protecting your client's information, right? Don't redact the names. Don't put in personally identifiable information, but you can still use it to write emails if you just change the names, right? Answer questions with it. Um, and, and by the way, you can even have it fact check the answer. So uh, I didn't show this in the demo, but I had it go out and find the IRS page, the link that I could include if I wanted to after the text message to send to my friend for more information or where I could go and check the information. So um, yeah, it's just, I like focusing on the real world today applications just as much or even more than what's gonna happen in the future. It's changing so rapidly um, that that we might get there soon. I, it's, just, it's just so much fun. And it was great to see the audience's eyes light up. And um, I hope our listeners here on this show will give it a try. You know, if you haven't signed up for ChatGPT, you can do it for free, pay the 20 bucks a month and uh, get the pro. And now they've got this new feature called GPT where you can build your own customized chatbots. And I've been playing around with that. And I want to talk about that um, and show you some examples. I'm not quite ready, but perhaps in the next episode, I could show you some of that, David. So Blake, we got a question in the chat. Um, show that up. Somebody wants to know. Uh, John, I cannot. My eyes are too small. You're too blind. John uh, Cronin. Cronin. Okay, got it. I wasn't sure if it was a C or G. Um, asking you specifically if the AI presentation will be available for you to watch and listen to. As I know that Intuit or QuickBooks recorded the sessions. Yes. But I don't know what the plan is for the sessions, if they're going to publish those on YouTube or anything like that. But what do you think, Blake, of doing a uh, webinar on our platform and kind of redoing your talk? Yes. And I want to show the AI you can use today. So stay tuned, John. Uh we're going to make that happen. Toward the end of the year, things calm down a bit, so I'm hoping we can actually do that in December. I would love to, and, and, and it'll be the latest. We'll, we'll use the GPT feature that's now available, the custom chatbot feature in, in ChatGPT, walk through like making your own tax research bot, um, a bot that could write like you in your style. I've done that for myself, and now I can ask it to write posts uh, for my blog, and it it can copy my style pretty pretty well. It's I'm get, I'm getting better at it. So, um, doing tax research is a great example. Analyzing documents. So yeah, I want to bring this to a wider audience. We had 500 people in that, my session at QuickBooks Connect, but I feel like there are thousands of accountants who would be interested. So look forward to that. We'll let you know when it when it happens on this show. Stay tuned. Do you want to talk about? Uh, there's a are, are we done with QuickBooks Connect? Or is there anything else QuickBooks Connect related? Do we catch it all? I mean, we probably missed some stuff, but I think that was a good summary. I think we should move we on. Got most of it. Uh, so EY in Texas got a $3 million penalty by the Texas Board of Public Accountancy. And you'll never believe why, Blake, why they got this fine. <laughs> well, what did Ernst & Young do, David? Well, there was an SEC investigation, and eventually that trickled, trickled. You know, they start opening doors, right, Pandora's box. They discovered mm -hmm. that CPAs in Texas have been cheating on the ethics exam <laughs> of all exams. Cheating <laughs> on the ethics exam. So this is and not just Australia, because this happened in Australia, right? Yeah. And yeah. now, well, it's happening here now as well. 
Um, and, you know, the big, huge fine of $3 million when EY's revenue for 2023 was $49 billion just doesn't seem like uh, enough. Again, it's just the, the fines are a joke. And you, you would think, though, too, like the Texas State Board, like that money's going right to their coffers, right? <laughs> like it's not like they take a fine and it's allocated and it can only be spent on charitable, co- I don't know, or deals. It just goes to their general fund, I bet. They can spend yeah. anything they want. So you think they'd be motivated to have bigger fines. <laughs> yeah, I, I asked Bing to look up the annual revenues of EYUS and then divide this fine by their annual revenues. And then I said, what would that be if this was like an individual making $100,000? What would be the equivalent fine? And it said $15. So the question is... So it's a burger and fries nowadays. Right. Yeah. It's a, it sounds like a lot of money, but in the context of these big firms, it's a, it's a slap on the wrist. It's it's meaningless. It's not even a slap on a wrist because you would feel a slap on the wrist. Like this is, they've it, they won't even notice it. Nobody's yeah. going to notice this. Well, so I saw this reported in the accounting press, and we should say that this follows a one hundred million dollar fine that was issued by the SEC in June of twenty twenty two. So now Texas has gotten around because this happened in Texas to fining EY, but you know even. Even a hundred million dollars is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's still only a few hundred dollars. Like if if EY was an accountant making a hundred thousand dollars a year, it's only like, you know, a few hundred dollars. Fine. It's like a par- it's like a speeding ticket. So, is behavior going to change? I mean, it's shocking that you would have EY staff cheating in a systematic way on ethics exams. Um, this does well, maybe, more damage. Maybe the ethics training is really boring and they don't want to do it. That's the problem, so, I think, actually. Just, like, it's too much work. I don't have time. It's boring. Just give me the answers. I'll take the quiz. Yeah. Well, and they got, I think they got in trouble. I don't know all the details, but it was because they were passing around the answer key, right? So actually, maybe AI is going to be the solution to this and they won't get caught anymore because now you can just take the exam and you can copy the problem, the multiple choice question into ChatGPT and ask it to give you the answer. And it will give you, it will, it will help, it will pass the ethics exam. That's easy for AI to do. You got to pay for the pro version, but for 20 bucks a month, you can have it take all your exams. From the other side though, you could possibly have AI create a random test for each single person, real time. Right. Yeah. And actually if, if nobody would ever have the same test ever, I blame NASBA, AICPA, these boards of accountancy for this because they've created a system where the exam doesn't change year after year. It's the same for everybody. And so it's really easy to cheat because all you need is one copy of the answers and pass that around and and you can cheat. So if you create a system in which it is easy to cheat, you have created an unethical system, if you ask me. I... I'm going to go back to my college days. And I remember going, I, I think I had a friend in a frat house. I was never involved in a frat. And I remember there was a room with file cabinets. And all that was was old tests for decades. Yep. I was but, in a fraternity at Northwestern University. And one of the selling points of the, uni- of the fraternity, it wasn't the, it wasn't the reason you joined, but one of the <laughs> selling points, the sweeteners, was we had a file cabinet full of exams. And... They and were they difficult. Change, many cases. Many times the professors didn't change the exams because it's a lot of work to change your exam. And these were tough courses, right? We had a lot of engineers in my fraternity. And so they had all the uh, you know, prerequisite courses, like the ones they had to take, they didn't really want to know. <laughs> you know, like all the all the pre-med students would have the, you know, the biochem or whatever stuff. Exams that were really hard. Yeah. You create a system in which you make it easy to cheat, you are guilty too. So I, I think that um, it's, the, it's not just EY, <clears throat> and it's certainly, I don't really blame the staff because when you're brought in as a young staff person into a firm where unethical behavior is like prevalent and, and um, systematic and endemic, right, it's really hard for you to be ethical. You, you're, you, have, you have to choose your job, basically, or your ethics. And what do people... You know, when people have to feed their families, what do they do, right? 
Yeah, choose your job, yeah. You choose your job, right? There. So this is on NASBA. This is on AICPA. I don't know which exam this was, but it's on them too for not investing in creating an exam that is, is um, resistant to these cheating tactics. I spotted this story in a CFO.com article that also highlighted something interesting about EY. They disclosed proactively that the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board found flaws in 46% of the EY audits it examined in 2022. 46% of EY audits were deficient, according to the PCAOB. It's so very previous, much higher. Previous stats were, in general, th- one-third or all faulty, and now we're or EY specifically, it might be half. Is that? Yeah, close to it. Yeah. And it's way higher than their deficiency rate of 21% in the previous year. So think about this. We have like really high audit deficiency rates. The PCOB already announced that when they put out their formal report for 2022, it's going to be like close to half of all the audits they looked at were deficient. So you've got rampant cheating. And we know that if this happened in one instance at EY, if they got caught for one time and it was this broad, there were like, you know, 50 something people involved in it. I think we can bet that it's happening a lot more, right? You catch one instance, how many go uncaught, right? Yes. So we've got this problem with like rampant ethics issues at big firms. And then we have massive audit deficiencies. I mean, the, the profession, the audit component of our profession has a serious problem. And has it really gotten that much better since Enron? 20 years ago? If anything, it might have gotten worse. Well, I mean, how much of this is the shortage? Like, people just don't have... I have to knock out my billable hours. I don't have time to do a four-hour ethics yeah. training. Well, and that's the, that's the situation these staff are in, right? They are pressured to, to get all these audits done. Uh, partners are under-budgeting, under-charging, working their staff to the bone. It's all to make a buck, right? Where's the ethics in this? So... One of our live stream viewers, and thank you for joining us. If you want to join us on our live streams, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. Mr. Hall says, what is the effect of audits with errors? Why does it matter? And that's actually a good question. Um, And maybe this is why so many audits have errors, because research has shown, uh, according to Baruch Lev at, I think he's at, I don't want to say where he's at. He's in New York. I forget what university he's at, but he wrote The End of Accounting. He's got stats based on his research that like audited financial statements only account for a small percentage of investor decision making anymore. We had a perfect example of this last week. It's what current was that? news. So there was uh, Bloomberg pro- published an article that uh, Bill, well, Bill Holdings, so as we all talk about it, Bill.com, Bill Holdings was going to acquire Melio for $1.95 billion. Bill, Bill Holdings stock fell 15%. And the next day, um, Billcom announced that they are not, it was just a rumor, they're not going to do it. So so major market movement, yeah. not on the financials in any way, shape, or form, it was based on a rumor or, or press or the other, it's just reinforcing an entire book was written about this. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, it's too easy to manipulate financial statements with estimates, right? It's gotten really easy to do that. And man, we, we know that management does it. They smooth out earnings. And so those earnings really aren't that useful to investors. And so what is useful? It's the rumors. It's the uh, subscriber numbers. Remember when Netflix stock plunged? Uh, I don't remember if that was like a year or two ago, but it was, it was, they reported that their subscriber numbers dropped and the stock tanked. And I looked at the Gap financials and there were no problems with cash flow, no problems with anything else. And it's because the investors care about the subscriber numbers, but that's not anywhere in the Gap financials. But it's the thing they care about the most when it comes to subscription businesses. And FASB hasn't tried in the slightest to take any of these subscription metrics and build them into Gap. I don't even, I don't know why they haven't even tried. It's kind of, did you know that the only financial ratio in Gap is earnings per share? It's the only one that is actually defined. Wow. The rest of companies can use or not. And, and we have this whole, um, world of SaaS metrics, which are very useful for evaluating SaaS companies, but we don't require subscription businesses to report them in any standardized way at all. It makes no sense. Well, it's even tougher, too, because 
what is just a subscription business? Like all business, we've talked about this two years ago. I think we were at uh, Oracle NetSuite's conference and it was Kevin O'Leary, but all business are, businesses now are everything businesses. Yeah. You know, they're, they're a widget creator and they're a service provider and they're a SaaS business and they're, everybody's everything. And like, how do you compare that side by side by side? Dark Horse says, audits have errors because no none think 20-somethings do the majority of the work. I know because I was one of those at one time. <laughs> and this is what's wrong with our profession is that we send kids right out of school who know nothing, who, who haven't even passed the CPA exam. We, we have them go work as staff accountants at big firms auditing Fortune 500 companies, the biggest companies in the world. They don't know anything. How are they supposed to actually like do good good audits. It should be the other way around. It should be they go work in corporate America, they get their skills, and then we take the best of those people and turn them into auditors. And those people should be really independent and be empowered to go find the problems. And hopefully they're at a point in their career financially, personally, where they can, they're not, they're under pressure, right? Yeah. Just like they have, they, they've, they've matured enough where they can't be put under pressure by a boss as much, right? Yeah. So related story, David, before yeah. we move on, the PCAOB also announced that they have doubled their fines in recent years. They're bragging about this, uh, taking more enforcement against the big firms, which sounds good. But then you look at the amount of the fines for 2023. So far this year, PCAOB fines have reached $11.9 million. Now, if you add up for a quarter of a trillion dollar in revenues, if you start taking the top six or seven firms, right, and add it up, it's almost like a quarter trillion dollar of revenue. They've yeah, fined let's 11 see. Million dollars. Um, I haven't verified I, this, but I asked Bing. I asked Bing uh, Chat, which is now called Copilot, I guess soon, to add up the revenues of the big four in the U.S. And they said it was like eighty billion dollars. So twelve million no, divided no, by. No, it can't be. It can't be. Because, oh, you said the U.S., just the U.S. Just the U.S., yeah. Okay. Yeah, because remember, these firms are just networks. They're independent yeah. in every country, and they share the same brand and logo. So I don't think it's fair to compare their global revenues against a U.S. fine. So, I do. <laughs> it's a better headline. <laughs> well, the glo we'd have to look at the global fines. Yeah. But anyway, if you divide, their, if you divide the fines for audit deficiencies by the U.S. revenues... And then you like, it's it's like point zero 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 one five one percent, which is if 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 the entire audit industry were a staff accountant or a manager or something making a hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, that's one hundred and fifty one dollars. So again, it's like two for parking tickets industry. in L A. For an entire industry, <laughs> this is yeah. crazy. Yes. Yeah. So it's, like it's... like of course it doesn't make audits better, right? You're not going to change behavior unless there's a financial incentive or you send people to jail. That would help too, but we're not going to do that. All right, let's move I, on. I, 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 I have one piece of negative news that, that kind of ties back into all this as well, and then we can move on. But, you know, I've been... We, we're going to lose everyone, couple, David. I know, we, the last couple <laughs> weeks, we talked about how Workday ERP migrations seem like yeah. they've been bubbling up for the public sectors and education. Well, it's not just Workday. So apparently the city of St. Louis has now had a botched rollout of an ERP, but for the, this time it's Oracle. And they worked with Accenture, and it's the two, and they also have the same stories. Everybody, everybody's trying to replace their forty-year-old system. Yeah, they're signing deals with these consulting companies. The deal's eight million dollars. It balloons into fourteen million dollars, right? And it gets rolled out. Bills aren't getting paid, so vendors yeah. aren't getting paid. You know, the worst case scenario is employees of the city aren't being paid. And you know, and the funny thing is now people are just a lot of. Uh, name are blaming right so the current mayor is blaming the old mayor well they picked it out this is their fault it's not our fault um and they're using qu quotes like this is, new system is horrific we were sold something that's kind of wacky and we're we're having to fix it um and, and one of the real issues they're saying it's a lack of preparation and training in the comptroller's office and i'm thinking like yeah it's probably because there's not enough staff to actually properly structure this in a way to roll it out then it makes me wonder who are these consulting companies and then it's like oh it's probably a 20 year old that's never actually done anything is coming in to roll out an ERP <laughs> oh, I guess. system for government. In. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Hey, Hector Garcia has joined us. Hector says, what's up? How do you still have your voices? It's a very good question, Hector. Um, I don't know. Well, that's why we did not record on Thursday. I'm recording today on Friday. Exactly. We took a day off. Great to see you, Hector. Um, 
Okay, let's go back to app news because there's a bunch of news that we haven't covered in a while. Um, where do you want to start, David? I thought it was interesting that Zoho, I think I'm sharing. Am I sharing? I see client management made simple. Yeah, so Zoho, which I've always said, because Zoho has maybe, what, 75 products. And I said, if they ever figure out how to start getting them to talk to each other and unifying that experience, mm -hmm. it could be kind of a little bit of a force to reckon with. Well, they've rolled out, and I didn't see this coming at all, but they rolled out a practice management software for accountants. Really? Um, and so accountant this, practice management software? Wow. For, for a firm. Okay. Right. So you have your 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 client management, so your clients are in there, right? They uh, you can track your tasks for your team and the work, you know, getting the work done for each client. Uh, secure document management. So these are all kind of separate products that Zoho has always had, right? And they're bringing it uh, in. Street, you have task management that's streamlined. Timesheets and billing for your accounting firm. Uh, they're doing insights and books review, so it can read the connected Zoho Books file, maybe you're connecting a QuickBooks file, and it can pull and makes those insights. So I just thought it was really interesting that they have a whole, like they're really pulling together their entire ecosystem into mm -hmm. one product. Because they also have, you know, uh, document signature products. They have Zoho Mail, Zoho CRM. So you can really, you could really run an entire firm now just on Zoho. And yeah. not just the firm, all your clients on a complete stack, but did not see them releasing client management. I thought that's kind of amazing. So I personally don't know any firms that are like on Zoho. It's all, everyone I know is either on Microsoft or Google Workspace. So if you're listening and your firm is on Zoho, I would love to know what you think, how you feel, and um, if you are going to try this practice management. Here's my tech story that I've been saving for a while, David. This is really just uh, to dig at you. Uh, TechRadar.com did an article, Best Laptops for Accounting in 2023. I've never seen any tech site do that before. That's very specific, right? And guess what the best overall laptop for accounting is? It's the Apple MacBook Air 15-inch. <laughs> because this was written by who? Probably not an accountant. Probably not an accountant, right? That used now, to excel. I am an Apple user, and I know there's a few of my accounting friends have made the switch, but the vast majority are diehard PC users, which makes sense given that everybody's on the, it seems like most people are on the Microsoft stack. Um, yeah, it says, uh, it says, while this, uh, let's see, it says in our in-depth review of the latest 15 inch M2 MacBook Air, we lamented that it doesn't offer much above and beyond the model with the 13 inch screen. While this may be true, those extra two inches or so can make all the difference when pouring over spreadsheets on the breathtaking liquid retina display. So, um, does it have a ten key that Mac? Does it have a ten key? It doesn't. It they none of them do. It's a, that, this article is bunk. This is total crap. <laughs> you should never bought this. There's no way the top five laptops for accountants. Not one has a ten key. <laughs> Give me a break. Uh, good call out. Good call out. Uh, Intuit has made some updates to other software, their tax software. Intuit Tax Advisor now allows users to preview up to five clients simultaneously, offering insights for potential tax savings and strategies. It's got new strategies for client plans, the ability to switch between state and federal returns, and strategies for determining qualifications for certain tax benefits. This is Intuit Tax Advisor, Intuit's planning uh, suite that I think is actually fairly new. We may have talked about it last year or the year before. Uh, ProConnect Tax Users. ProConnect tax users can now directly import client data from the IRS, create and send templated letters to clients, and access a comprehensive dashboard. Additional features include email notifications for rejected e-filed returns, customizable digital templates for tax return documents, and the ability to batch up to 10 multi-modular federal, state, and local extensions. LACERT users can now send client returns to SafeSend directly within the platform, start tax plans for 1040 clients with a single click, and create and e-file an unlimited number of W-2s and 1099s. The feature also supports e-filing and printing forms within a business and across multiple businesses individually and in bulk. Uh, and if you are a Pro Series user, you can now automate data transfer from your existing infrastructure to the hosting environment. You can also transfer current year TurboTax individual 1040 returns to current year Pro Series returns and create and e-file an unlimited number of W-2s and 1099s. How'd I do, David? Good. 
I think there was uh, other Intuit news. You know, Intuit's shutting down Mint. I don't know if we talked about that yet. We didn't talk about that. And you sent me a blog post from the Quicken CEO, and you said, full circle, something <laughs> like that, right? Because Intuit spun out Quicken. Quicken yeah. was the precursor to QuickBooks. And a few years ago, Intuit sold off Quicken. And sold now Quicken, Quicken is its own standalone business. Yeah. And then and, Mint was the big darling, right? It was very hot tech acquisition. Yeah. They brought in brought in Mint. Um, then now they're rolling this into Credit Karma because Credit Karma is the new darling that makes a lot of money, yep. right? Uh, the interesting thing I think about this, and this is the tricky part, is when, at the end of the day, personal finances are a hobby. And that category never really grows. And so it's just like, I th think Credit Karma has, because they're offering other features, they have, they have the Credit Karma bank, uh, credit reports and all the other stuff. They, it helps them actually um, monetize this a little bit more, but it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now where it could make sense, and we, and we didn't talk about this from QuickBooks Connect, but QuickBooks has their workforce app. Right? So your employees, if you're an, in, uh, an employee getting paid by QuickBooks, you can have an app that you can use for your timesheets to check your pay stubs, right? That app, that could be an interesting place to have personal finances right next to your pay stub. Mm. Right? You, you view your pay stub and you can also do some budgeting or work. That, that would make sense. But it's just, it's, it is full circle. Like these apps come, everybody gets hot and bothered over them. A decade later, they're not the shiny new object anymore. Right? And that's the thing with acquisitions in general. Yeah. You see a lot of acquisitions and not, not many acquisitions work over the long run. It makes me sad because I was an early Mint user and I just, that thing was game changing for personal finance for me. I, I, I started using it when I was making the career transition to being an accountant. And I was the, I, I, basically I started using it because I was this, I was a poor musician working at Starbucks and I couldn't figure out why my bank account kept going down every month. And that's how I got into accounting. <laughs> I was using arguably, Mint. I, arguably, Mint was the grandfather of bank feed accounting. Like that was like the first app that you're like, oh, I connect these banks and it pulls down the transactions automatically. Before that, I don't think any other apps are doing that. We have a question from one of our live stream viewers. Aaron says, isn't the Workforce app from a third party though? I think it's a QuickBooks app. Now okay. they might be, maybe be working with third party to have it developed and skinned, but it's a it's a QuickBooks app. Yeah. Um, I realized I forgot to talk about this earlier in the show, and it's in the headline on some of our live stream platforms. So I got to talk about this. Um, CPA Trendlines had a crazy stat this past week: forty two percent of accountants turn away work over staff shortages. Forty two percent of accountants are turning away work because they can't find enough staff to do the work. Only 27% say it's not a problem. And 24% say we're hitting burnout. So you add those together, the 42% and the 24%, and you've got 66%, two thirds of firms are turning away work or worse because they can't find enough staff. 24% are outsourcing, only about a quarter are outsourcing at this point. So I think that's going to be a big area of opportunity for firms because it's either offshore, outsource, or... It's tech and AI. I AI. mean, you're going to have to supplement and be more or efficient. Both. Yeah. You're going to have to get more. Yeah. 10% um, are looking for mergers to save them. I don't know if that... <laughs> I, I don't, you're not getting enough, the same amount of work's going to exist. Yes, you've doubled your staff, but you brought in all that extra work. Well, I think the idea is like, I'm a, I'm a partner who's 60 and I just want to get out before the building collapses <laughs> is really what that means. That's how they refer to save. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's merge up and get out. <laughs> and then the staff are left with this like totally dysfunctional, even larger firm, unfortunately. I mean, they, and was it 42% you said or 47%? 42%, uh, 42.2% 42 of firms are turning away work because they don't have enough staff. And that is from the CPA Trendlines Outlook 2024 Emerging Issues, Opportunities, and Trends Survey. 
So it's almost half the people. All right, so that you go to you go to McDonald's and you get in line, and McDonald's tells every other customer, "Sorry, we don't have enough staff today. We can't make your Big Mac. Move yeah. on." That's what's happening, and that's industry wide. So then you go next door to the Burger King, and it's a you're, you're rolling the dice. If if you need an accounting firm to do your work, it's a coin flip whether or not you're going to get your work done. Yep. Um, I'm just going to go and pick out some more stories from my tech stack of stories. Yep. Client Hub. Client Hub has introduced AI-enabled email integration. The new feature allows emails to be integrated into your workflow, enabling staff to assign, track, and manage tasks and deadlines within a unified platform. So basically, in the past, Client Hub had this wonderful chat feature. Uh, so you could you know, set up your clients with the Client Hub app, and they could chat with you securely. But emails were not included. There was no way to bring emails into the client hub. And actually, I told them, you have to, you have, to have a way to bring in emails. And so I'm so happy that they did it. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to be able to bring in the emails in order to act on them and have everything in context. So well done, client hub. You listened. And I, I assume it was not just me. I assume it was the, um, it was the customers too. So there's also AI-powered magic email features. That's their term, magic email. It includes drafting replies, summarizing lengthy email threads, and assisting with tone, saving time, and improving the quality of responses, which is uh, one of my favorite use cases for AI, as we talked about at the beginning. It's automating drafting of those messages to clients. So um, it's going to be available to standard subscribers by early December 2023. And if you do start a trial now, you can try it out for free for 14 days. David, what's in your stack? Uh, I'll just keep going. Yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm, like, yeah, w w w I'm trying to figure out what qualifies next to talk about. You know? well, I, I think at this point, we've reached the point in the show where we're just like, it's, it's, it's it can be random. Nobody cares anymore, right? <laughs> okay. Um, Multiple income streams. Now you can track them independently. This is from FreshBooks. A new feature in FreshBooks. Um, it's kind of funny that this is a feature. I mean, I love FreshBooks, don't get me wrong. But like the big announcement is that now you can have multiple revenue accounts in your chart of accounts. Previously, you were limited to one. And I never understood why they did that. So now you can, you can have multiple revenue accounts in your chart of accounts. So... Uh, so, Go ahead, David. So three different apps or three different companies all raised major amounts of money for, you know, their AI tools for accountants. One was called Black Ore. Oh, yeah, I have Black Ore in my stack. Black that Ore. Ten, that tool's a little bit more of um, uh, tax document scanning and then eventually connecting it to um, your, into a pro series or your Lasserts or your uh, um, Thomson Reuters. Well, right? what's so, crazy about it, David, is how much money they raised. So the they headline is sixty million. Sixty million dollars, and nobody has ever heard of this company because they were in stealth. Well, the the, the one of the founders did build a successful app that's on the platform or on QuickBooks called Funbox. It's like a, a small business loan invoice right. refactoring style po product that's out there. Um, the other big raise is Puzzle. So they are building revolutionary AR powered accounting. They raised thirty million dollars. Um, Stamply, who's been around, Stamply's been a, an app that uh, was kind of in the AR side of the business, and they used a lot of AI and technology. And now Stamply just uh, raised another $61 million for its AI-powered accounting platform. So you're looking at um, $120, $180 million raised by three yeah. companies to do AI and accounting. So that, that's the big one. I think if, it's like money kind of dried up, but at the same time, if you have AI and you're utilizing AI, you know, you're going to get that money now. Was interesting speaking of AI. I did watch in a video with the um, founder of Blackor, and it was an interview. I and he went on to say that it's only like maybe 10, 10 percent ish is actually using kind of modern AI the way we're thinking about it. Chat AI, GPT. Outside of that, the product kind of reminds me of Drake. Which right? one? Where you Drake? It doesn't Drake. I'm not familiar with this full tax side. But doesn't Drake just scan old? Uh, 1040s and all those and scan all that and then 
give you the data that you can work yeah, with those on the So which of these startups are we talking about right now? Oh, that one's Black Ore. Black Ore. Yeah, I wanted to go back yeah. to that. Okay, yeah. because like, I was like, what is this app? What does it do? Why did they deserve $60 million? <laughs> and basically, uh, from the press release, it sounds like... Do you want to share your you, screen? Well, I'm, re I'm reading it in my Notion, not in... Uh, wait, oh. actually, yes, I have it here. There we go. So here's the press release. And <clears throat> basically, it says accounting firms can upload tax documents and data into a secure portal. Okay, whatever. Who cares, right? Everybody does that. The data is then transformed and the return calculated, significantly reducing the time required for this process. The platform also generates tax return and supporting work papers for review. So basically, you upload documents, it puts them into the return for you, and generates, I guess, work papers. If you switch to their website, Blake, click their website link in that, mm -hmm. the, there's an animation on their website that actually shows the product kind of working. This, this one here? Yeah. So I'm putting in a new prep request, create, and then you drag and drop your files. So you've got all the files, and then it labels them, submit request, and now it's using AI to prepare that return, and we are seeing uh, files in folders. And when organized. we say AI, it is OCR. So it's getting OCR of these PDFs, and that's what I said. Isn't this kind of like technology that's been out here for a decade? Yeah. Well, and it's been available with human-powered you know, people putting the numbers into the returns. So, like, this is basically just the next step in that, is is automating further with, I suppose, AI. And, and apparently there's human review, too. And so my question is, how much of this is actually AI, and how much of this is just that fake AI that we've been covering for years, right? Where, you know, it's just human well, beings. Well, well, it, yeah, it's really, I always think of it as data entry as a service. Yeah. Because like, at the end of the day, if you're an accounting firm or you're a small business, do I care if AI put the bill into QuickBooks automatically for me or if a human typed it in for me? I don't care. Right. Just get it into my QuickBooks correctly or, or get it into my tax software correctly. So I, I, I'm i okay with data entry as a service. And it could be a mix of the two, some AI saying this, because mm -hmm. I just don't care. I want the I care about the output, the hole in the wall from the drill, right? Now, I think so. I think this is interesting, but what would be more interesting to me is if the AI actually went out and got the documents from the client because that's the bottleneck. It's not putting the numbers into the return, it's getting everything you need to do the return. And that's where you're going to see the next billion dollar tax prep company is automating that aspect for accountants, if you ask me. I, I'd be curious though what our live stream viewers and our listeners think. Where is the big opportunity in tech for tax? And is black or going to do it? Or is this just, you know, a bunch of people who, <laughs> I mean, what's funny to me is how many of these founders too have no background in any of this, right? They've, they've, they've just been customers of like tax prep, right? They, well, they're yeah, not, you... they're not tax preparers. They're not accountants <laughs> and they raise tens of millions of dollars to disrupt our industry. And I think well, this... a lot of times they go on the wrong path because of it. I think they're really good at building the uh, the side deck and building the product investors will invest in. Right. If you go to Puzzle.io, their website, right? Essentially, it's it's another accounting app that's targeting startups and it's bank feed accounting. Here we go again. It's just like we're going to go and read all the bank feeds, look at all these transactions we've categorized, but then I mean, they always have their stat. If you scroll down, 150 plus investors have invested. Right. Right. It it, it like. If you're shopping for this, like, what do you care who invested, right? Is this website set up for somebody to, to use with their clients, or is this yeah. website set up to get an investor to invest more money? I don't know. It's just this is why an app like this can never succeed, in my opinion, because the market is so narrow for bank feed accounting like this. Like, and and I mean that in the sense that people who will pay significant money, anything meaningful for this type of product, is very low. It's, it's startups. It's, it's, it's it. startups making software for startups, which is like this yeah. very cyclical, um, sort of like incestuous thing. That can, you know, you, unless you go to the main street businesses, you can't build software like this that will. It, it like the only company that's ever become 
you know, multi-billion dollar company in the U.S. serving small businesses for accounting is into it, as far as I know. It's like yeah. the only one. <laughs> it, it, the, the, and, I, and, I, and you've always said this, the, the startup accounting is the easiest. If, if that might be the only one that could be automated. You, have, you basically have some expenses, they're all being paid by a credit card, and you have some salaries of employees. You're yeah. not allocating costs, you're not doing anything complicated whatsoever. You're just, yeah. it's the, that might be the, it's, bank, it's only bank feed accounting, that's it's, the only one you're gonna be able to do. It's burn accounting is what it really is. Burn it's just accounting. categorizing your burn. And startup accounting actually, um, I mean, maybe there's some folks who do startup accounting that might be offended by this, but in many ways it's not that complicated because you're just taking all these expenses and you're bucketing them into like five different categories. You, know, you got your R&D, you got your general and administrative, you got your OPEX. I mean, you got your um, sales and marketing, right? And it's just, it's just ratios of those things. And the churn of startups is like the average, what, what is it, the stats? 90% of small businesses go under? I think yeah. startups, it's even more higher than that. Barely any startup makes it out. Yeah. So, um, I, it, it, again, it's just, but it's a lot of money and it's being raised because of words like AI powered accounting. Like, yeah. It just, when I see companies like this raise money, it makes me think that a lot of these investors are, I mean, we, we know this to be true, that they don't invest based on the product because they don't really understand the market. How can you, unless you're deep in it, you know, how can you know whether something really is going to solve a problem? They're betting on the founders who already have a successful exit and they're just hoping that they'll figure it out. Yeah. So they're, and they're even know, playing it up, right? Uh, founders from GitHub, KPMG, Apple, EY, Lyft, Affirm, PwC, PayPal, Y right. Combinator. Yeah. So, and there's this whole FOMO thing. So, it, if you're a if you're a successful startup founder, th this is the thing: the second time founders or the third time founders always love to get into accounting because that's something that was painful for them. So they want to get into that and fix that thing that was painful for them personally. But I don't think a lot of times there's a market for that outside of like NetSuite and QuickBooks. You know, how do you compete for those? Like, as soon as somebody gets big enough, they're going to go on to NetSuite, right? You're, so, so all the all the big accounts, all the money is going to end up in Oracle's pocket, not in yours, if you're Puzzle. Because as soon as they get big enough, they're going to stop doing this bank feed accounting stuff. They're going to have to do real financials. Yeah, and that's the. I mean, that's the dilemma. I think uh, we we've seen firms have this issue. They lose their clients. Yeah. Once the company, once the startup gets so successful, they have to bring they, they have their own in house controller, their own in house CFO. They don't need the accounting. They don't need a cast. You know, they don't need to be a client as a cast client anymore. So, I guess we'll watch it. But yeah, a lot of money being raised. Here's one more story while we're here that I just want to highlight. Um, and this is something that I bring up in my AI talks. I think Google, Alphabet, as it is now, as the parent company is now known, is in trouble. I think that I would not want to be a Google or Alphabet investor because 80% of Alphabet's revenue is from search, traditional web search. I have stopped using Google as my first place I go to search. I am now in the Edge browser using Bing Chat, which is now being rebranded to Copilot. And that's where I go to find answers first because it's just faster. I get a natural language response, and I can click through on any of the sentences to find the source of the information. I don't have to and go dig through. this is true through. on your phone as well, your iPhone? Yeah, you yeah. I changed all your stuff to Bing now? Yeah, I have a, um, I swipe over to my widget screen, and I have a little, uh, I don't know if that'll focus there, but I have basically a focused. widget. It's not focusing, but I have a widget, and I just press the little microphone icon, and I can ask it any question. So I can say like, What was EY's U.S. revenue last year? I'm sorry, oh, but it didn't understand EY's. What was the U.S. revenue for Ernst & Young last year? Now it's searching Ernst & Young, U.S. revenue last year. Ernst & Young, EY generated a revenue of $19 billion in the United States in the fiscal year 2022. However, EY's global revenue for the financial year ending June 2022 was $45.4 billion. And then I can go click through on that $19 billion number, and it takes me to Statista, where I can double check it. Why would I do a Google search? 
So think about that. 80% of Google's revenue is from search, traditional search, and they have the worst AI chatbot, Bard. And even if they can improve it, how do they, how do they keep the market? Because they currently control most of search. Yeah. So, so there's a big possibility that even if they advance with their AI chatbot so that it's good, they'll still lose market share to Microsoft and to Amazon. And then how do they monetize their chatbot? Are you going to have ads in the, in the chatbot? And how do you do that? Like, there's a lot they have to figure out. And I think their dominance, they've sort of just, like every other company, they get to a point of, like, dominance and they stagnate and they don't innovate. And, and what's great about Google versus everybody else at the time, you just got better results. And arguably the results aren't as good. And now you're starting to see other companies have better results. And at the end, people want the end product. That, yeah. That's how they're going to judge it. So, uh, and something to watch out for is, I think, Amazon. Because... We all have these Amazon devices with voice assistants in our homes now. At least I do, right? I know a lot of people do. You have at least one. So far, the AI in that has been pretty bad, and you use it for weather, kitchen timers, maybe buying, reordering Playing stuff. who let the dogs out. That's, that's always the... <laughs> Alexa, play who let the dogs out. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. She didn't hear it. Um, but, like, if they, they made a multi-billion dollar investment into Anthropic, which... Um, makes Claude, which is a better natural language AI model than ChatGPT in my experience. It, it's better at writing. It's better at spe It's better at all that stuff. It has less fewer features right now, right? It doesn't surf the web or anything, but like that could be added. And so if, the, if they actually make these voice assistants like really good and have access to all of your different calendar and, and mail and, and be able to act like you as an agent. The data that's on your phone, especially. Yes. Right. Yeah. And the data that's just in, in all of your, if they can connect to all that, they can have the ultimate AI assistant. And same thing with Apple, right? Apple with Siri could, could totally upend Google with actually like, like, can you just imagine being able to do all the stuff that I'm doing now in the chat GPT interface, but just talking to my phone? Yeah. And, or what and, if it could and, like passively listen to me and just like make suggestions like it's an assistant you know, if I've, if I've got my AirPods on, it's just listening. And as I'm having conversations with people, it's like whispering in my ear. And, and the fact that Apple, they went, they're making everything super secure on the phone now, the data. Yeah. Privacy, data, privacy, data, privacy, yeah. data. Really, because that way, when they do create some sort of AI tool, they'll be the only one with access to the data, which will make it the greatest tool that's ever existed in the history of the world, right? Yeah. It'll be the most amazing thing, but it's because they're, they're going to keep everybody else out by making under the guise of privacy. Right? And the biggest concern with these models is the privacy, right? If you're going to let your whole life into these models, you'd better trust it. So yeah. I, think, I think Apple has that advantage. I think Amazon has the advantage of they've built this whole smart speaker network and people, a lot of people have them, so that could really help them. I think Google... Google couldn't figure out how to make a phone. They couldn't figure out how to make devices. They literally just live in your web browser. I think they are screwed. The phone's good. I got the phone. <laughs> you're this, like this phone, one. This phone like the, took a great the, picture of you. How many the, people at QuickBooks Connect had one of those phones? A Google. <laughs> right? Well, okay, that's the problem. I don't know if that's, there, there's a lot of people that iPhones, but there's also a lot of other phones because accountants exactly. are going to buy the top tech usually. Yeah. So... I don't know. Is that is you know what, what will happen to the stock price? What will happen? Like this is truly disruptive, and it's crazy to think that Google, like, you know, didn't really even exist. Like twenty years ago, it was just this little search engine, and here it is now, top of the world, and now it could come all crashing down. That's how this fast is, things move now. Yeah, and I don't know. We could digress and like talk about this is why government regulation and all that doesn't really matter because there's always going to be somebody who figures out how to do it better. That's that, the beauty of an open market. That's what's funny about all this is, yeah, Google is facing all of these um, <clears throat> anti-monopoly kind of like cases, just like Microsoft was, right? And like it might not even matter because Google might not even be the dominant player in a few years. AI is so transformative. Is there it's any an comments time. we should wrap up on? Any, uh, I don't think so. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for hanging with us on this Friday. A reminder to our podcast listeners, subscribe to us on YouTube. You can join us live and get notified. Hit that subscribe button. Um, we will be letting you know about a webinar I'll be doing on AI for Earmark. And if you need CPE, 
Don't forget that you can earn CPE for listening to this show and many others, such as Oh My Fraud, Federal Tax Updates, the unofficial QuickBooks Accountants podcast, um, FP&A Today, gosh, so many more on our platform. And uh, you can earn free CPE one a week. And if you want to support Earmark, you can subscribe for just $130 a year for unlimited CPE. You can get almost all your CPE done on Earmark. The only thing we don't have is those state-specific ethics courses. But you can just go to some other provider, download a PDF, and put all the test questions into ChatGPT to get the answers. <laughs> because they make it that easy. We should have, at the beginning of the episode, welcomed all our new listeners. So when we go to these events like QuickBooks Connect, we get lots of new subscribers of the podcast, and it drove us up to we were number eight on the Apple Business News charts. We were up we there with so many subscribers. We were up there with above NPR shows. We were with up there with Wall Street Journal shows. Um, it's kind of funny to think that in five years, David, you and I have gone from broadcasting to a few dozen people from our spare bedrooms to having a show that is the number one podcast for accountants by downloads in the world. And thank you to our listeners who want to make change and want our profession to be better and want to attract younger people in who have a uh, growth mindset. You want to know one of the coolest things about my son's school is they have this concept they teach all the kids about a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. We never did this when I was a kid. It was I like, didn't ever see that until I was 30 years old. Yeah. Got into it when I started seeing that. Wow. They're teaching the kids about how to have a growth mindset, right? It's to, it's to believe that, I'm probably, I'm not explaining it the best, but it's it's believing that you can change and be better and and having having confidence in yourself to be able to do that. They teach that to the kids. Whereas a fixed mindset is this is the way things are, this is the way they've always been. And unfortunately, I think the people leading our profession have a fixed mindset about accounting and are not willing to change. And uh, until we make change, until we either change their minds or get them out of there, you know, and get new blood in, um, it's, you know, not going to change. But I, I feel like it's happening. When I go to conferences and I meet people, I meet these these really innovative practitioners and CPAs and accountants who believe that accounting could be a great and prosperous career. It doesn't have to be a grind. You can have time with your family, time for yourself, be healthy, and be an accountant. And I think the all the tech and is going to help us do that. So that's on, that's on my, that note. On that note, thanks everyone. We'll see you again here next week. <laughs>